us for this webinar today. My name is Nancy Ramsey and I'm the director of the Soul Repair Center located at Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas. So I welcome you to our webinar series that is co-sponsored by the Volunteers of America Shea Moral Injury Center that's directed by Dr. Rita Nakashima Brock, a senior vice president for the VOA. The Soul Repair Center seeks to provide resources for religious leaders, for hospital, VA, and military chaplains, and civilian professional caregivers who support veterans affected by moral injury and their families. This series provides information in areas that are under-researched or for which information is not yet publicly available. Today's, today's webinar falls into this latter category. We are exploring resources and strategies for responding effectively to veterans whose experience of moral injury is further complicated by dementia. Currently information to inform such care is quite scarce, though the need is great and will be greater. I want to express my, my appreciation particularly to Juliana Lesher, National Director of the VA Chaplain Service, for her help as we sought out VA chaplains who could share their experience and expertise with us. Their willingness to offer their time via phone calls and emails further informs this webinar. Our webinar will be moderated by Rabbi Kim Geringer. She serves on the pastoral care and counseling faculty of Hebrew Union College in New York City. Rabbi Geringer also holds a master's in social work and she serves on the National Advisory Board of the Soul Repair Center. Kyle Fauntleroy, a director of development at Bright Divinity School and former captain in the US Navy Chaplain Corps will moderate the chat. He's a founding member of the Soul Repair Center National Advisory Board. Please direct your questions for the presenters to him via the chat line. Sam McAllister from Volunteers of America is our production person. Dr. Rita Nakashima Brock is the Senior Vice President and Director of the Shea Moral Injury Center at Volunteers of America. She's the founding director of the Soul Repair Center and is one of the early and leading voices in education and research about military moral injury. More information about Dr. Brock and her publications related to moral injury are available on our website. Dr. James Eller holds both a DMIN and a PhD in social work. He serves as the Kronzer Endowed Professor in Family Studies and co-director of the PhD program in gerontology for the Garland School of Social Work at Baylor University. His publication record is extensive and he brings deep in expertise in our discussion about dementia and care for those affected by it. As soon as the COVID epidemic subsides, he will undertake a national qualitative research project related to this webinar. I serve as Professor Emerita of Pastoral Theology and Pastoral Care at Bright Divinity School, as well as directing the center. We will proceed with each of the three speakers making presentations accompanied by a PowerPoint. Rabbi Geringer will then moderate a time for conversation among the three speakers, followed by our engagement with questions that you pose in the chat. I want to assure you that a link to a recording of this webinar and the accompanying PowerPoint will be posted at this website and at the VOA YouTube channel within two weeks of this event. Thank you for your presence with us. We look forward to learning with and from you in this webinar. So Sam, if you could uh, load the PowerPoint, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm, uh, as Nancy said, I'm Rita Nakashima Brock of the uh, Shea Moral Injury Center at Volunteers of America. Um, and um, in, in the last three years since I've been at Volunteers of America, I, my work on moral injury has branched into a number of areas. And so um, it's really a delight today to bring myself back to the focus I had at the very beginning on veterans and the importance of uh, the work in uh, veteran studies around moral injury. And I'm just going to post um, a, a short reference to a journal article, which um, was published in December of just this past year, that is a research piece 
uh, based on a pilot program for recovery from moral injury that we actually ran here at Volunteers of America and with that was quite successful. Uh, so if you're interested in reading about that program, how we measured success and what the program entailed, um, that article in the Journal of Veteran Studies from December will, um, uh, it contains that information. Next slide, please. So the title of this event, of course, is Dementia Care for Aging Veterans Affected by Moral Injury. And so my job today is to help you understand what moral injury means in veterans. Next slide, please. So these are the two prevailing definitions of moral injury that have been being used for the last decade or so. Um, there are variations or glosses on some of this, but, but I, I think these are pretty comprehensive if you put the two together for understanding what we mean when we say moral injury in veterans. And the first one was proposed by Jonathan Shea in his early work on Vietnam veterans. And he describes it as the undoing of a warrior's character resulting from a betrayal of what's right by someone who holds legitimate authority in a high stakes situation. All three, a betrayal of what's right, legitimate authority and high stakes situation are required for moral injury to be present. Um, and then the second definition was uh, created by an entire team of VA clinical people who, psychiatrists and psychologists, based on their uh, years of experience um, counseling veterans and discerning that despite good treatments for PTSD, they were seeing something else that those treatments weren't addressing adequately. And the first time they talked about it was in an essay in 2009, but this book, Adaptive Disclosure, is a fuller discussion uh, in book length. And so I'm using the definition from the book that was written seven years after they proposed this definition. And it, the definition is, moral injury is a syndrome of shame, self-handicapping, anger, and demoralization that occurs when deeply held beliefs and expectations about moral and ethical conduct are transgressed. It is distinct from a life threat, and life threat is here means PTSD. It is distinct from PTSD as it is not inherently fear-based. It can arise from killing, perpetration of violence, betrayals of trust in leaders, witnessing depraved behavior, or failing to prevent serious unethical acts. It involves a loss of meaning that results in destabilized identities, damaged relationships, and despair. Next slide, please. So what do they mean by morally injurious experiences? Well, they listed some of them. This is a scale that uh, one of the co-authors of that book um, created. It actually has 11 items, but the, some of them are slightly redundant. So I'm, I'm just listing the key ones. Um, seeing things that were morally wrong, according to the person's sense of moral rightness, witnessing others' immoral acts, acting in ways that violated their own morals or values, failing to do something that they felt should have been done, feeling betrayed by tr lead trusted leaders they once trusted, feeling betrayed by fellow service members they once trusted, and feeling betrayed by others outside the US military they once trusted. So there's the commission of an act, um, witnessing of an act, being feeling betrayed by others, um, and um, feeling betrayed, uh, and uh, also failing to do what they should have done. Next slide, please. So this is a Venn diagram uh, that Bill Nash actually in, uh, created that shows that there are overlaps in symptoms between PTSD and moral injury, um, overlaps in symptoms and behaviors, so that it's easy to um, be treating PTSD and not notice that underneath it might be moral injury because they can look similar. So <clears throat> with PTSD, you get the classic fear responses of, of startle, of hypervigilance, of uh, flashbacks. <clears throat> and the, uh, PTSD also has memory loss people often um, are so uh, terrified that they, they don't have a coherent memory of what happened because in a high fear situation, your normal memory processing mechanism shut down. Um, and so you can have um, holes in your memory and uh, or, or complete absence of memory of the incident, but have flashbacks about it. 
um, with moral injury, the dominant emotions um, and uh, symptoms have to do with what are called moral emotions. So grief and sorrow um, are, are often part of how we experience moral failure um, and also the losses that may be caused by our own acts. Regret, shame, and um, alienation are also all aspects of the moral emotions. Um, I would add guilt to that list. Um, and then they overlap in that um, either, either one can cause someone to be angry, depressed, anxious, unable to sleep, having intrusive memories through nightmares, um, and using self-medication to try to calm down the symptoms. Next slide, please. Oh, and I wanted to add also that the one uh, form of moral injury that correlates to high levels of PTSD um, was, was reported in a 2018 study, um, lead author Jordan, that um, showed that uh, uh, 900 combat Marines didn't have elevated levels of PTSD from combat, but they had elevated levels of PTSD from betrayal. And they don't know why. Uh, they don't know whether it's a cause and effect, a, co a coincidental alignment, or something deep like moral injury can cause PTSD. Um, so so that, that's an interesting finding about how difficult betrayal is for people to deal with. So this is another Bill Nash diagram that just shows you how many dimensions of a human life are affected by moral injury. There's the emotional repertoire with that list of moral emotions there. There are the relationships that, they, that originally were in that person's life, but their loss of trust now makes difficult for them. Um, and their sense of maybe being unforgivable makes difficult for them. Their own identity, their own self-concept has changed. They may say they are not good. They may even say, I have become evil. I can't be trusted. I'm a failure. I am hopeless. Um, and their concept of the world, of course, aligns with its shift in identity. And so they may lose their faith, meaning, or sense of purpose in life. Um, and their own um, management of their own behavior, what we call executive functioning, can also be compromised because they have difficulty calming down. Um, they may be impulsive because they're angry or just depressed and unresponsive. And then the, the last factor is the one that's most relevant to what we're talking about today, which is it is unpredictable over time. You can have someone who was in the military um, who is able to function, do good work, um, and then as they reach the end of their life, their capacities intellectually to keep the moral injury experience is suppressed or um, not bought, sort of like um, not that they don't want to go there or think about it and they avoid it. Um, and that that capacity may weaken. And so it may actually emerge late in life, even though it may have been there all along. So so it can the the way moral injury erupts in a life is a bit unstable and unpredictable, and it can come and go. They may think about it for a while and think they've got it resolved, and they may come back in another form. So, so that, that's, the, that's the thing we need to think about for today. Next slide, please. So here, here are um, important things to keep in mind about moral injury. First, it's sometimes latent, as I said, and it can emerge long after events or experiences. Um, and highly, uh, into, you know, uh, highly mentally tough, um, determined, and stubborn people can avoid it for quite a long time. I know an Air Force veteran um, who who was uh, in the Air Force during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, and uh, he. For a month, he was a B-52 pilot, and the, for a month they put those planes in the air fully loaded with nuclear weapons in case we had to go to war. And so he spent a month as the pilot of a B-52 with a fully loaded plane, a bomber, waiting for DEFCON 1, which meant he was to fly to Russia and drop a nuclear weapon. And even though he didn't have to, it haunted him for 40 years, but he said, I just played a lot of golf and made a lot of money and didn't think about it. And then in his seventies, when he got ill and thought he might die, he was flooded with all the memories of moral injury that he had experienced in 1963. So uh, it, can, it, can lay, it can lay inside someone for a very long time. I believe moral injury is an aspect of most trauma 
Um, and so if you have a veteran who's got some trauma, um, it's good to think about how moral injury might be in that trauma um, because uh, there's now research that shows that if, uh, if you treat veterans with PTSD, those who get help with moral injury are, have improved outcomes for the PTSD. Um, so it's important to understanding how moral injury relates to trauma. It isolates people. They don't want to talk about it. I don't know any of us that would want to talk about the worst thing we ever did or experienced. So uh, it creates isolation, especially emotional isolation. Um, and it can be an accumulation of traumas. It may not be one big incident, but it may be a sort of death by a thousand cuts, a slow um, wearing down, which I actually think we're seeing right now in healthcare workers because the pandemic has gone on so long. Um, and it can affect anyone in a high stakes profession, um, not just the military. And right now people are thinking about medical, EMTs, law enforcement. Um, we, we actually had a Capitol policeman on Saturday kill himself who was at the um, takeover of the building on Wednesday. So um, it's, it's any high stakes work where you feel like you failed to do what was right. Um, and it can emerge in witnesses. Um, you can be so devastated by something you witness or even hear about that it can also um, emerge as moral injury in, in people who didn't actually experience the event it's, itself. Or, um, so that's also important to keep in mind um, that you'll have people who, who don't have anything to report that they did, but they um, saw something that completely shattered their sense of faith in good pe in people being able to be good. So I think Nancy, now it's it's yours. Thank you, Rita. Now we're going to uh, see it. If you go to the next slide, now we're going to look at a series of slides rather quickly, um, intended to help you recognize and help all of us recognize the really pressing need to look at uh, the coincidence really of vulnerability to an experience such as dementia and to moral injury, in particular uh, from mil military moral injury, particularly because of the age, uh, age relation of our veterans. So you see here that uh, though that begins with 2017, um, you can see that we still have a significant number of veterans and many of these, as you'll see in a moment, um, would have served in um, some in Korea and a good number from Vietnam. And those veterans are certainly in a population that is more vulnerable to dementia. And as we'll see, dementia can be um, exacerbated uh, or um, prompted by um, morally injurious uh, trauma. So, um, I want you to, to simply notice the um, significant number of veterans who will be with us uh, for quite a while. And then if you'd go to the next slide, Sam, um, you can see how it's predicted to, um, to decline uh, if we get all the way to 2037, but you can see that we have a significant portion here of uh, some persons that are still um, with us from the Korean conflict uh, and obviously a large segment of persons who were in Vietnam, both of those being um, brutal kinds of conflicts and um, if, as every war would be. But um, now those kinds of trauma, post-traumatic stress, uh, we know is a contributor to dementia. If you go to the next slide, Sam. Now, one of the things I also want you to notice is um, the percentage of, of white veterans um, that will eventually decline, um, the ways in which given that decline, the percentage of um, African-American or, or black veterans uh, will increase uh, by percentage. And, um, and one of the things I wanna underscore is that that's going to um, um, persons who are minoritized by race in this culture and in the military are also um, vulnerable to moral injury related to racism. So we'll have a, a double kind of experience for some of moral injury. Next slide, Sam. This is a bit more information about race um, and ethnicity uh, and the experience of minoritized veterans. And you can see here, just to give more statistics, that um, the number of minoritized veterans will increase um, and that the um, 
the experience of that um, of persons who bring that additional stressor of, of moral injury um, will be an increasing percentage of the veterans for whom we care as they grow older. Go to the next slide, please, Sam. While the Gulf War era veterans are now the largest cohort, please notice how many of the folks from, especially now the Korean conflict this is 2017. So if we go forward three years as we're at the outset of 2021, um, we can imagine a significant portion of, of Korean veterans and especially Vietnam veterans. No doubt the COVID um, uh, epidemic has taken its toll, especially on these oldest Americans. Nonetheless, this is a significant portion of the veteran population that would have known those two wars and especially the stressors of Vietnam. Next slide, please. I think this chart makes it um, more easy to see in terms of the um, lingering number, how long it will take um, for the, or, or how long, maybe better to say, how long we will be caring for veterans from Vietnam. Uh, and, and then the coincidence with veterans of the Gulf Wars. And it will be important then to pay attention, if you go to the next slide, Sam, for the coincidence then of post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain inj injury. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But it may be relevant to see where these veterans live and will live um, according to this chart um, that you might be particularly attentive to where you are, where the services of, uh, that you may offer or a center where you work is in terms of um, this shift. Sam, you might show the next slide, please. It shows this geographically. Sam, if you go to the next slide, please. One of the things we know about risk factors for dementia and for Alzheimer's in particular is the importance of paying attention to traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress, and the other factors noted here, uh, including, of course, depression. Sam, go to the next slide, please. And this also means um, that paying attention to the fact that veterans are then at a significantly greater risk for Alzheimer's than the general population. Um, so, um, which is uh, only 15% over 65. So um, it's important then to realize, not only do we have a significant number of veterans who've had exposure to those um, predisposing events, but that they, um, uh, they are at a higher level in the, in the um, general population. If we look at the barriers to effective Alzheimer's diagnosis in the next slide, Sam. One of the, one of the things we need to face and that we've certainly heard in the media is that um, it's challenging um, to um, interact with the complexity of the VA health system and um, to have an adequate understanding of the benefits available, as well as the stigma of acknowledging brain and mental health issues. We know that a number of, of veterans try to avoid naming these kinds of issues uh, when they come home. Let's go to the next slide, Sam. This is from the, as you see, the Veterans Against Alzheimer's, and you may want to look at the resources of this organization, but I, I want you to note that, um, that the current um, um, cohort of older veterans from uh, Vietnam and Korea certainly um, have um, recorded evidences of post-traumatic stress and that we're going to be adding um, shortly older veterans from the Gulf Wars that will bring, in addition to post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, which will only increase the vulnerability to uh, forms of dementia, including Alzheimer's. Sam, if you go to the next slide. Here you see, while this is 2004 to 2014, I've included this slide simply to show you the exponential increase in veterans with um, um, Alzheimer's. And we can know, given the number of Vietnam veterans, that there's no reason to think that kind of exponential growth has declined. Sam, if you go to the next slide, please. 
I'm, I want to show um, this kind of, this, I've shown this kind of statistical review in order, uh, I hope to prompt um, all of you that are involved in responding to veterans and particularly those of you that might be leading faith communities to reflect with um, about who the veterans are in the communities of faith you serve. Do you know them? Have you made connections with them and with their families? Um, are you, do you continue to be available to them? And have you established relationships self-consciously with the veterans in your community? One of the things that um, a VA mental health counselor mentioned to me is that in the context of COVID, there's been an increase of requests for care because veterans have relied on access to one another and the conversations that they have only with each other about traumatic stress, for example, and experiences of moral injury, that they uh, are not as easily having, let's say, on the phone. This might be relevant for those of you who uh, have responsibilities as, um, as faith leaders for um, touching base or being available to veterans in the communities you serve. Sam, we, we go now to Jim. I'm the old guy that has to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Nancy. This is real helpful. Uh, the concept of bringing together uh, moral injury uh, with dementia is somewhat anecdotal at this stage. Uh, I teach at Baylor University School of Social Work, and, and everything we try to do these days is all evidence-based. Uh, for the most part, uh, we're working from inductive uh, circumstance at this point more than we are heavy data sets. And so I would just kind of precaution our discussion uh, based on that. Um, for me, my uh, experiences with this uh, date back to the 1970s when I was in school. And uh, I worked both uh, in a Jewish nursing home as well as in a VA. In the Jewish nursing home, they had a fair number of Holocaust survivors. Holocaust survivors have obviously uh, been through just about everything when it comes to trauma. Uh, but we used to have uh, older adults with mid-stage dementia who would be fine. You could sit and have more or less of a conversation with them. And then uh, you would get them near the, uh, the washroom where the showers were, and they would go ballistic, absolutely ballistic. Uh, thinking that we were taking them to the showers in Auschwitz, making that kind of unconscious uh, connection with that. Uh, clearly an embedded trauma. Uh, at the VA, uh, I worked with World War I veterans. That tells you how long ago that was. Um, but uh, they would talk and they would, they would even share some of their experiences of uh, being in World War I. Uh, but the minute that uh, the gas comes up. Uh, and on a medical unit, every once in a while, there's the hissing sound of oxygen going on and like that. There are all kind of, are too many cues to that that people aren't terribly conscious of. And all of a sudden, they go ballistic. Um, there's something going on in all of that. Uh, in the field of gerontology, uh, since the 1960s, we promoted the concept of reality orientation. Uh, everything has to be built on reality. And frankly, evidence-based work has the same um, uh, uh, positivistic theory, theory behind it. And the whole idea is you wanna make sure that you're on solid ground with a person. When you're working with someone who has dementia, by definition, it's really hard to get an evidence-based story from them. Uh, and therefore, as we work with them, uh, we have to assume the story is what it is. The story I like to use is actually from my own father. Uh, he was on a troop transport in World War II and uh, he was the Lieutenant in charge of small boats. And uh, after, in, after the invasion of Saipan where the US troops were met at the beach by the Japanese, uh, he, once the troops had gotten far enough inland, he was sent out on a small boat with weights from the bilge of his ship to sink the bodies because it was considered too gruesome for soldiers on land to look back and see their buddies floating. 
and what he would do is take the uh, uh, re remove the uh, dog tags from each person and then sink the bodies. When uh, he accomplished all of this, he came back and he had a fistful of dog tags, which he gave to his captain, who he didn't like much. Uh, and the captain immediately just walked over to the side of the boat and pitched them all off the side. Um, he talked about that into his dementia a long time. Uh, it was clearly very hurtful. And it was not something he talked about prior to his dementia. So we had no idea. You couldn't ground it in any reality. Uh, the captain of the ship by then was long gone in terms of our ability to access them. I'm not sure we would have gotten a straight answer from him anyway, if my father was correct. And uh, so you're left with not quite knowing whether or not the situation is there. From a pastoral perspective, we have to assume this person feels the story. And when they're feeling the story, then from that perspective, um, we need to minister to it. Uh, and at that point, to the extent that it can be verified with reality, that's terrific. But it's their reality in that moment. So uh, anecdotal experience suggests that, that there are seniors who are, are making this connection unconsciously. Uh, and, and I'm not using a Freudian definition of the unconscious. I'm really saying it's buried in memory. And at that point, it's coming out. Uh, memory is a funny thing. Uh, old memories, you know, lots of people anecdotally in the community will talk about how people will remember 1932, but they won't remember what they had breakfast for breakfast this morning. One day I tried that out on a group of seniors and I said, how many of you remember what you had for breakfast this morning? And they said, oh, uh, you know, about a half of them couldn't remember that. Well, I said, all right. Now, it's really an unfair question because the real issue is how well patterned the memory is. Uh, it has very little to do with uh, old versus new, uh, because in reality, short term memory is really short term. Uh, but uh, then I would say, you know, who remembers what they had for breakfast in 1932 on this date? And one day one stuck his hand up and said, I remember exactly what I had for breakfast that day. And his response was, I had uh, two eggs scrambled bacon like that. And, and I said, that's amazing. How do you remember it? He said, I had the same breakfast for every day for 30 years. Um, repeated memories are things that people remember, but things that kind of go as a flash in the pan or without any kind of emotional impact have a way of going away. They do for all of us, but especially for older adults with dementia. So what we're talking about are really pattern and often hidden memories. My third example to throw in here at the beginning is a firefighter. I tend these days to work more, and more with firefighters and uh, law enforcement. And we had a firefighter who went to, was off duty and went to a beach that's in a uh, lake in our area. And because uh, he heard someone screaming that someone had gone under and wasn't coming back up, turned out to be a six-year-old uh, who in fact had drowned. Uh, and he was absolutely furious with the church group that the little girl belonged to because they should have protected her. And then without so much taking a breath, he talked about how he was uh, in the Gulf War and uh, his night vision goggles had failed and he was clearing a house and a, uh, someone started yelling in Arabic and charging toward him. And so he shot the person. When the lights came on, it turned out to be a six-year-old. Uh, and he had really no capacity to make the distinction between the child who drowned and the child he shot. Uh, he would tell you that he had no emotional problems and no PTSD. Uh, that's also to uh, uh, be worked on. And I sent him to therapy, frankly. But uh, the issue is that uh, these are embedded memories. And so here in the beginning, uh, we get the idea from these kind of anecdotal experiences. My last story with this comes from my work with Howard Gensler, uh, because a similar concept that we worked on is how do you help a person with dementia grieve the loss of a loved one? Lots of nursing homes find out that a spouse or an adult child or someone very close to the person with dementia has just died. 
And the question becomes, the hard question in long-term care is, do you tell them that that's happened? Because when you tell them, they grieve the loss, but a person who's more mid-stage in their dementia is very likely to then sort of be uh, redirected and they can sort of forget it. But then the next time something comes up, then they go back through the grief process and you're watching them constantly go through the grief process. So we published a couple of articles on, on how to address that. It's a similar phenomenon to what we're talking here. The research has not caught up with pastoral practice, and yet pastors are seeing challenges that need to be addressed. And so uh, that's where at least I'm coming from this. Um, the people that are I've seen that are most likely to uh, come up in this are Holocaust survivors. There are still some children of the Holocaust out there, uh, but that, that group has uh, dwindled down. Children of children of the Holocaust may also have some residual trauma. Um, and these would be persons who were, who their parents lived through the Holocaust and then they got married and had children after the war. Uh, but those children also have impacts long-term and we need to be conscious of that. Um, veterans, of course, which is what we've been talking about, uh, and persons with other unresolved um, uh, trauma, whether that's in the military or in some other uh, context. Um, basically, um, dementia allows emotional access to old uh, traumas in part because uh, the dementia itself breaks down inhibitions. Uh, and so from a developmental perspective or developmental development of the Alzheimer's, there is such a thing as an early dementia that can hit people in the 50s. Uh, we used to call that a pre-dementia uh, and it's had several names through the years. Uh, Ellos Alzheimer, who first discovered Alzheimer's disease actually was first originally working with people in their 40s and 50s with dementia. Um, and it was only in the late 70s, early 80s that we put together that Alzheimer's that was common in folks over 75 was the same thing as Alzheimer's uh, that uh, took place uh, back in, uh, in the earlier stages, 1903 when Alice Alzheimer was working on all of this. Um, but uh, Clearly, what it does is it, it brings down the barriers. Uh, I live in Texas at this point in my life, and uh, Texans like to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. And, and there's a lot of sentiment, particularly among first responders, about how I, I don't have any emotional problems until I fall apart, right? Uh, but the issue here for us is that uh, they, they ball up that trauma with so many coping mechanisms that at the end of the day, it's sort of hard to drill through them. Um, and the rule of thumb usually as a therapist is that if a person has something successfully coped with and they're not having problem with it, you probably should leave it alone because a person who's 85 uh, may not have 10 years to work with them to get it to deal with it. Uh, and so you, you sort of don't mess with it. But in this case, it's leaking out in some way. And so then the question is, how do we cope with it or how we deal with it? And that is our pro project for today. Can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, so with a dem dementia diagnosis, um, the, uh, for the most part, the diagnoses that are most likely to be impacted are the global dementias. There are over 150 different things that can cause memory loss in older adults, uh, none the least, least of which I think is retirement since I'm six months away from doing that. But uh, the uh, global dementias are more likely, in my experience of it, to be accessible to this. Lua body dementias, for example, which that's a fairly new concept on the horizon, tend to be um, earmarked by people with delusions of uh, animals and nature scenes. Uh, that, uh, for the most part, that's not the kind of trauma we're talking about, but that may be what they're struggling with. And, and uh, I haven't seen them go back to these earlier uh, kinds of memories uh, in my experience of it. And I haven't seen any literature that suggests it. I, my own belief is, frankly, I suspect they could still have a moral injury buried under it, but the Lua body style dementia will cover that. 
Um, Parkinson's is the same way. Parkinson's comes on slowly. And for the most part, the inhibition breakdown is going to take place uh, as or, or really early on in, a, in the dementia phase of Parkinson's. And to that end, then, um, uh, it would be different. Uh, circulatory dementias or Alzheimer's disease are the ones where I see the most um, practical application to this. Uh, now, again, I'm not a neurologist and I haven't seen any neurologist try to take this on. So uh, this is one of those, uh, we'll see as time goes on, uh, kinds of uh, uh, discussions, uh, but it is coming for us. Can we move the next slide? From a dementia progression perspective, um, you can kind of see on this slide, which uh, uh, comes from the, the content of this comes from, you can see the citation at the bottom at Bustal and Ham, um, but uh, the, uh, uh, the actual slide I made, but uh, uh, the concepts for which came from them. And, and essentially, there is this, again, relatively new concept of mild cognitive impairment. About 60% of people with mild cognitive impairment uh, will go on to have a, uh, a lifetime uh, uh, terminal illness uh, of one of the dementias. Uh, however, I have a good friend who's actually on the editorial board of the journal that I edit, um, who hit got the diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment. He'd been an alcoholic. Uh, and when he dried out from his alcoholism, the, the diagnosis went away. And so uh, it is possible with that early kind of stage that it could go away. There is also all of these folks that because they become 65, all of a sudden being forgetful seems to be part of the nomenclature. And so, uh, you know, they talk about being forgetful. My rule of thumb, quite frankly, uh, is that if they can remember it enough to realize they forgot it, it's probably not Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer patients have a way of when they forget something, they truly have forgotten it. And it's kind of like somebody wiped the slate clean, although actually that is not accurate. Um, there was a time when I sort of thought, um, you know, 40 years ago, I thought that when you had Alzheimer's disease, there was a little man up in your head that was wiping out all your, all your memories, you know, like an eraser on a blackboard. Um, that's really not the case. It turns out neurologically that those memories are still there somewhere. It's access to the memory that becomes the greater issue, not so much the loss of the memory. Now, as neurons become destroyed, then those memories would get lost. But uh, there, there is still a lot of memory and you can check that when you're on any dementia unit because people will come forth with memories that you, you had no idea. They come straight out of nowhere with a reality memory. But you can kind of see as the earlier stages of the actual uh, issue um, that uh, where reduced inhibition becomes the case. They may express gas. They may um, start talking like truck drivers. I worked on a unit uh, for a, a convent unit of old, older nuns uh, and thought I was at a, a truck stop. Um, and it, it blew my mind because quite frankly, my, my view of nuns is that they're kind of sacred people uh, and to have them talking like truckers um, uh, through me, but that's, that's the reduced inhibition piece that breaks down the barriers to the people want, who wanna pull everything up on their bootstraps and forget it and bleeds out some of these kind of memories. Um, after that, if you get by you somewhere, there are different theories as to how many stages of dementia there are. And lots of people think very uh, strongly, I, well, I know there are this many, that's fine. Uh, I've been working on this a long time and I've seen everything from three to about 20 stages out there. Uh, so at some level or other, um, somewhere in the middle of the time, they don't respond to logic. Uh, and when a person doesn't respond to logic, then a whole lot of our Rogerian uh, storytelling kinds of concepts have to be discarded um, because they, they're not working with logic. And if you respond to illogic with logic, you've probably lost something. I wanna move quickly through the next couple of slides if I could. Um, 
because I do want to pay, move on. But as when we're challenged by the dementia, first of all, we're doing assessment. Uh, we would hear the troubling story from the senior uh, and then um, be made aware of troubling stories sometimes from families. Sometimes families will come to you and say, um, just so you know, this person went through X. Um, uh, it comes out to some extent if the person has a military background, um, but it may not, some other things like a childhood rape or the like may not come out quite as quickly. Um, then there is, you can confirm some things by talking to family members um, and then family input can maybe give you a larger piece. That's this question of reality. Um, but and frankly, as you work with the person with dementia, it's best that you become a caregiver who admits care because a person with dementia, do, they do get it when they see a person who cares about them and is not confronting them. Uh, sometimes you can put people with dementia into a panic when you confront them with what amounts to a reality and they can't remember the reality and therefore they feel badly about that. Uh, and so you do best to emit care and concern and quite frankly, not be too troubled by reality versus irreality. Next slide, please. Um, possible responses then, remember that the story may or may not be verifiable, but it's a, uh, it's a reality to the person. If the senior seems to be traumatized uh, by the memory, then it's real to them, at least at that moment. Uh, acknowledge the trauma, offer caring and forgiveness through symbols. And I'm going to uh, let uh, uh, Dr. Ramsey uh, talk more about that a and then contact uh, caregivers. Sometimes it's helpful to get a perspective because sometimes caregivers can give you some reality to things and that may give you cues as to other things they might bring up. Sometimes that's the first time the caregivers have ever heard of it. Uh, and so at that point, you don't really know. Next slide, please. The uh, challenges, many seniors with dementia cannot tell their own story. Uh, uh, that's even true of music and songs. Uh, I'm a baby boomer and uh, I challenge periodically my fellow baby boomers with the question, ba back when we were dealing with the greatest generation through ritual and prayer, um, you could always sing the old gospel hymns from around 1900 and they could all chime in. But I'm not sure what our baby boomers, what songs our baby boomers are going to relate to. Maybe I want to hold your hand. I mean, think about it. How do you tell your own story if you don't remember your own story? That to me is a tragedy of dementia. Uh, seniors with moral injury may not have told their families. Objective records may no longer be available. Um, and the trauma may continue to be real or dredged up. Veterans on veteran units will frequently pick up stories from other veterans. And so they'll come onto the unit with X disturbance. Back in the 70s with my World War I sailors, soldiers, I had a sailor who tells me that he fought in World War I. And when I asked him more about his experience, he said, well, I was aboard the USS Maine during World War I, we were anchored a lot in Vermont, but we killed a lot of Nazis. Uh, if you follow that story and you know enough about history, the USS Maine went bat down 20 years earlier during the Spanish-American War. Um, Vermont hasn't got a big enough puddle to even make wet the bottom of a major uh, a boat like the Maine. Um, and the Nazis were, of course, World War II. But he was picking that up from other uh, persons on his unit. And so uh, sometimes what we get is sort of an amalgamation of that. If you know the people on the unit, you can sort of work with that. But here again, their fear of something is going to be real at the moment. And so very much uh, from the perspective of good care of persons with dementia, we acknowledge the fear and we offer them emotional support to the fear without necessarily trying to reinforce or acknowledge uh, the story itself. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this brings us to the research that we're trying to do. Uh, we've identified some partners in long-term care who have identified people that they believe reflect moral injury. Um, and we want to go in and interview them as well as their family members and try to nail down more specifics about this subject. Um, 
the challenge right at the moment is we're held up by COVID. Uh, but uh, at such point as the facilities open back up, we will go back to working on this research. So, um, Nancy. Uh, Thanks a lot, Tim. I appreciate it. I'm going to move a little more quickly, you all, and try to talk from the uh, point of view of um, pastoral practices, pastoral care in relation uh, and evidence-based practices that we know of um, for responding to persons affected by dementia, um, whether that's Alzheimer's or what circulatory or vascular dementias. And I'm going to try to draw on um, effective strategies for care. And from time to time, we'll invite um, touching base with uh, Jim Eller in terms of whether his research or expertise uh, or how it relates to this. But as I've talked with VA chaplains, for example, um, I, one of the things that we uh, that they've underscored is, you know, trying to assess the needs created by moral injury. For example, um, one VA chaplain was describing um, being called, you know, at the in uh, while he was, uh, he was the on-duty chaplain for the night, being called by a nurse um, for a, a veteran who was near the end of life and affected by dementia, who was in a, um, you know, a moral crisis. Um, remember that, of course, uh, um, forms of um, trauma, traumatic memory, are held differently than um, other forms of memory, and they can, you know, can, can emerge in this way. Um, so part of what he reminded me of is that one has to assess what, how precarious is this situation? Are we at the end of life? Uh, how precarious, uh, how serious is the level of anxiety? And does this person, if we've never met them before, if we're a, a floor chaplain, this is a, a new patient, for example, does, um, does this person know who we are? Does this person have a sense of who I am as a chaplain, for example? Um, are they clear between themselves and me? Um, and so clearly part of what we're thinking about is at what stage or what, what degree of dementia is this person affected? Then we wanna be able to listen for what are the emotional needs? If we go back to Dr. Brock's um, presentation, Rita described um, shame and grief and fear and guilt, um, listening for the kinds of emotions that accompany this remembrance of moral injury. And we might listen to for um, what sort of spiritual framework, if any, this person is using. Um, Sam, I, I should have told you to go to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thank you. Um, yes. Um, it's practices of care slam. There you go. And um, so we want to we want to think about what is the spiritual framework, if any, can we get clues? Are there references that um, if especially if we do not know this person, if we're a chaplain on a floor, or this is a new admit to the um, um, a, a veteran population in a retire uh, in a in a retirement uh, setting? or someone that's new to the continuing care environment, um, uh, then we might not know um, what, where do they, what spiritual framework are they bringing? Um, and do they have an identified framework uh, such as a Protestant or Catholic or Jewish or Muslim? So we're listening for their operative spiritual imagination. And if it doesn't relate to a religious tradition, can we at least overhear um, if it's if there's a, a base of fear there, if it's a more positive sense of, of a caring creator, um, and listen also for the spirits, what we would call spiritual needs, such as forgiveness or a sense of loving presence or hope. Um, and, and then I want to move to the next slide, uh, ritual resources for care, because alongside those practices of care, as Jim mentioned in his last um, slide, one of the things that uh, can be very powerful for persons in, um, in the context of um, moral injury, uh, because it is um, such a powerful sense of um, betrayal of self really, of, of one's ideal self, then um, um, this is, that's it, Sam. Uh, we want to know, do we know what ritual tradition or religious tradition this person um, may be most familiar to this person? And can we assess the spiritual or emotional needs 
like grief or shame, fear of death without forgiveness, and then draw on what spiritual practices may coincide um, with the tradition and the uh, spiritual needs. Um, and if they do have an identified tradition, then that might be uh, familiar prayers and sacred texts. We might, uh, given that the um, spiritual and emotional needs related to moral injury are shame-based uh, and uh, often a deep sense of grief. Uh, uh, and so um, more a sense of loss of a moral ideal self. Then um, for example, even um, certainly with, with uh, patients that are identifying with a Jewish tradition, we might think of the prayers of the high holy days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And many of those prayers are I have found relevant also for me as a Christian pastor. But we might also think about um, practices that are relevant within the Christian tradition um, that would bring to mind forgiveness, such as the Eucharist, for example, um, um, if in Catholic practices of um, forgiveness. And um, we might also think of uh, practices of washing, like in baptism or the mikveh. Uh, in Jewish tradition, or as one Muslim chaplain mentioned to me, the dua yeah, in Muslim tradition of praying for forgiveness. So are there familiar ritual practices and sacred texts that we might use? And um, certainly asking family um, about what, what, re what resources are available or useful to this person. And they, they too, uh, depending on the context, may want to participate in such processes. Let me mention three particular contexts um, that where I can easily imagine the combination of responding to a sense of moral injury with a person who is affected by some form of dementia. Go to the next slide, please, Sam. Thank you. I was uh, for a time a pastor before I um, did my graduate work to teach. And um, so part of what I'm thinking about, and I, I'm guessing that some of you have had that experience um, of caring for a congregant in their home. And um, this is part of why I made my plea earlier in today's session um, or webinar about um, for those of you that do have responsibilities for a faith community to be attentive to who the veterans are in that faith community so that um, the the opportunity to care for someone who, who begins to name um, an experience, a memory of moral injury, is not the first time you and that person have, have talked about their um, military experience. So one of the values here might be the, that you can draw on a relationship that you have built and that you know the ritual reminders uh, that can be of use uh, to this person. Um, and it is easier to assess the status of the veteran and the needs of the family present. One of the things that I, I want to underscore is you might be hearing something you've never heard before from this veteran. And it's entirely possible that the family is hearing a story that they've never heard before and try to imagine how that is impacting them, particularly let's say if this has been a marriage of uh, 50 years and, and now there's the story of deep uh, moral anguish that this veteran never shared with his spouse. Um, so the important thing is to respond to the express need arising from the recall of this moral injury and to do so in a context that um, uh, isn't judgmental, that is understanding. And that um, as one VA chaplain puts it, trying to move from uh, life-threatening shame to uh, a level of guilt, this person can kind of reposition in terms of other factors that likely shaped that experience. And then be able to, uh, I don't mean that all of this is simple as I move on from point to point, but to consider ritual practices that might be related to this person's need uh, for a sense of forgiveness, uh, for reminders that, um, that the divine's love is reliably present to them. Part of that means is that one hopes these are not the first conversations you've had about what their experience of God's presence and love would be for them. 
And it might well be that you and the family and this veteran would, do, would be able to participate in some ritualized process that is familiar to this veteran. Friends of mine um, and colleagues that have been involved in care with older adults most of their career indicate to me that ritual practices and ritualized um, experiences will last well into experiences of dementia. I know that I've sat next to persons affected significantly by dementia in a faith community experience who are able to share prayers and sing hymns that they've been singing for 50 years. So that, that memory is somehow available to them and one hopes can be helpful in a time like this. But maybe uh, if we move to the next slide, Sam, um, I know that some persons, or at least I hope some persons on this um, uh, webinar may be a chaplain in a continuing care environment. And in that setting, we may have veterans who are at earlier stages of dementia and, and along several stages that would still be in the, in the same community. Um, typically, there are different um, uh, locations in a continuing care um, setting, depending on the level of um, uh, difficulty that this dementia has um, created. And here it may be possible and useful to draw on um, possible symbols that would identify you in some clerical role. Um, and one of the things that chaplains in these settings have told me is that while um, a veteran may not talk to them about their experience, if they sit with a group of veterans, it's more likely that there may be sharing about their experiences of war. And it strikes me that at least at early stages of dementia, this is probably likely still true. So creating contexts in which one sits with a, a, a group of men, most likely who are veterans, then you might be able to, um, uh, to have some sharing and again, be able to do some of that re, um, reconstituting of that experience or reframing of it is probably a better way to say it. One of the things that I'm sure Dr. Eller would underscore is that when we are in settings like this, it's important to ask to draw on information that can be shared from this nursing staff to understand the status of an Alzheimer's patient. Um, and it's, it's important for us to be willing to step in to the present memory and its pain and to draw on resources arising from that veteran's spiritual home, so to speak, what, however we're able to discern it. And then again, to use um, uh, resources such as music or Im imagery, water as in baptism or as in cleansing, um, hymn texts or other kinds of music that may help this person have some sense of um, whatever their image of the divine might be. It, it can also be um, photographs or videos. Um, and um, I, but I, I'm underscoring that in this environment, you may, you'll have persons at different levels um, affected by dementia. Uh, and, it, and it may be that um, you'll be able to establish visitation over time that they'll at least, if they don't know your name, um, they'll begin to know that you're a trust, you're a person who seems to care. And that may be, that may facilitate sharing. Jim, are there things you would add to this particular, um, to these comments about a continuing care environment? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, when, when you're looking at ritual, um, my studies of it suggest that um, you're looking for um, things that have long-term pattern memory involved with them. Exactly. So, uh, Frank, when I, st I put together in the early 1980s a, uh, a worship for uh, folks on a dementia unit, uh, it happened to be a Methodist facility, so I went to Garrett Seminary, which is a Methodist uh, seminary, dug around in their basement and found all the old Sunday school manuals from that time. Persons who were in Sunday school prior to World War II uh, had so many things they had to memorize that all of that even into mid-stage dementia uh, seems to be held exactly. in there. The challenge right. for a person with dementia is always uh, patterning new memories. So you go right. back to old ones. You have to also remember that rhythm matters. 
And so prayer, for example, if you can set it up to have a rhythm, pretend you're a rapper, uh, it uh, allows you to uh, help with that because that also seems to reinforce memory. Uh, and then of course, the third thing is uh, to be with other people. It can be done one-to-one, -one, but uh, in a group, it works better. Right, thank you. I think that I'm gonna move quickly now so that there's time for the three presenters to have some conversation and to respond to your questions. But the, the final setting um, from continuing care um, would be for those of you that are VA chaplains or in military hospitals to um, hear again, it's important to be in conversation with the staff to um, um, assess the precarity uh, of this person and the depth of the dementia as they are aware of it. To be attentive to the veteran's sense of himself and of who you are. Um, how fluid is that or are they, and do they have some sense of who you are perhaps as a representative of the divine, however they construct what that means. And then, um, uh, to listen carefully for how this veteran may be voicing their sense of moral injury. One of the VA chaplains with whom I spoke in anticipation of this event talked about being called uh, into a VA center um, where uh, the situation was um, certainly near, we presume to be near the end of life, but this person, um, despite their dementia, um, had recalled a morally injurious experience and really needed to process it thinking and probably correctly that the end of life was near. So listening as this person needed to do, this chaplain needed to do for clues about the ways this person constructed spiritual experience. Because of course, everyone has different imaginations about the divine and the divine's intentions toward them. So listening carefully for the clues that this person gives you is important for responding effectively to them. And then of course, seeking permission to be present and to join in responding to what is a, for them a spiritual dilemma and being um, um, attentive to whether in fact, you can draw on any kind of ritual resource to augment and deepen an experience of what I as a Christian would call grace, that is, uh, or what we might call a, an experience of forgiveness, of cleansing, of hope. And um, those are the kinds of um, predictable uh, spiritual practices um, um, of, of, religion, of, of spiritual leadership as a, as a chaplain uh, with persons who are affected um, by dementia and near the end of life. Um, so you can, you can, if you go to the next slide, Sam, and this is the final slide. Um, I'm encouraging us to remember to establish a relationship over time where that is possible with the veteran and the family, um, to be known to the medical uh, and care team as possible, and to, um, to touch base with them if you're, re if you're visiting again, and to be mindful of symbolic identity if you could go back to that slide for a moment, Sam, um, if you can be mindful of your symbolic identity as an asset in healing, um, whether that means wearing a collar or wearing a stole, whatever might identify you as a, as a religious um, presence, as a person who uh, is a chaplain to this person, and then to be reflective of what symbolic resources might be fitting for this particular person. Those seem to me to be um, primary strategies for um, effective care. Um, and I, um, I wonder now if we could switch um, and um, Kim, if you could draw us together and um, we can take at least to maybe uh, 10 minutes um, among us for questions that have occurred to you or that you've seen from the chat that are relevant. Hmm. Um, sure. Uh, I'd be happy to. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to make sure not to miss a request from the chat for Jim. Um, Jim, there was a request for the source of articles about dementia and grief of a spouse that you mentioned. So in whatever way it might be possible for that information to be shared. Okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to turn them in. I, I, it would take me a few minutes to pull them out at this point, but. Okay, I think we but could probably add that, Jim, if you send it, we can add it to the PowerPoint, which will be attached to this uh, webinar. Sure. 
Okay, great. I, I wanted to make sure that that didn't get missed. Um, okay, um, among the three of you, um, are there questions you would like to address to one another before we go to some comments from the chat? Um, I had one as I was listening to uh, Jim and Nancy talk about the importance of rituals, uh, which I think are absolutely crucial. Um, and I think one of the reasons that ritual is so effective is that it's a whole body experience. It's not just an intellectual or even an emotional experience. It engages the whole person, especially their body in a habitual activity. And so when people can't access their words or necessarily coherent memories or um, a, a, a a verbal expression, which is really often crucial to processing a moral injury is being able to tell the story because that externalizes it and allows you to uh, actually to objectify it in a way to process it. And as long as it's unexpressed, it's just in there haunting you. Um, but if a person can't do that, if they're just beyond the capacity um, to, to tell a story, um, but they can do a ritual, I, I'm wondering also about um, other rituals that aren't necessarily religious rituals, but are uh, habitual body rituals. I, veterans certainly know this. The military teaches you a whole series of enact, uh, bodily enactments that if you do one gesture like a salute, it calls up the entire meaning system attached to that gesture and how it might be possible to use the body itself as a way to help people um, be more present to their own, to themselves. Um, one, of the, one of the things in our program with veterans we try to do is to help them remember being loved uh, as a way to ground their ability to cope with moral injury. And, and, there, and there must, and I think this would vary by religion and even by family tradition, but there must be touch gestures, body gestures, things that can be done to a person to help ground them in that feeling of being loved. Um, and I, I don't know how you would get that because I think, of course, there are ethical reasons exactly for not right. just automatically touching someone, um, but, exactly. to, to, but how we could discern from their family or from people who work with them in the care center, what right. do they seem to be comforted by? What forms of touch seem to work and help to help calm them? That, I think you've just named the, you know, the importance then of being in conversation. If we're fortunate enough to be, to to be working with someone for whom there is family available. <clears throat> but I, it also, and it also strikes me um, that um, chaplains uh, who are familiar with the particular ritual practices in whatever branch of the military this person was in might well be able to make some um, relationship to um, one of those practices and the moral pain and grief of this person because the military is so full of ritual. Uh, so I, I would, I would also want to consult um, with chaplains in that branch to see what what might fit here. But I think your point about if there's family that would be very helpful. Yeah, or even even certain freight that you know the Marine Hua thing. And I mean, so there 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 are these military codes that operate mm -hmm. that make people feel good about something. Um, and um, it, it just occurs to me that that uh, the body is so, as Bessel van der Kolk says, it's what keeps the score. Mm -hmm. And so it's so crucial in, uh, in trying to understand trauma that people carry. Actually, to, to that end, there is a question in the chat, which I think is, is relevant. Let, let me read it. Um, the questioner said, do you have an opinion on the value or harm of the honoring ceremonies sometimes performed by outside groups for individual vets in care centers? The rituals are full of appreciation with no room for moral ambiguity. Does that help or hurt those suffering with moral injury? Do you mean something like the the ways they do honor flights and things like that? Um, or I don't you, I don't I, I need a little more help on yeah, what this okay. honor ceremony is. Okay, um, I, I I'm not familiar um, myself, but I imagine I mean in general the question seems to be um, a sort of blanket honoring of people in a way that doesn't allow room for 
moral ambiguity for complexity I, of the person's experience with service. I'll be interested. In, I'm going to jump in and say that I, that 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 could be risky. If I'm struggling with a sense that um, uh, of a secret or something that I haven't shared, or I've got some flashbacks about that, um, then it may feel false. Um, I I'm not trying in a blanket way to say those aren't useful, but for a person who's struggling with moral injury, it could complicate their experience. I see Rita nodding. I want to yeah. see what, what she would oh, say. Somebody, somebody said it's, it's a ceremony used in VA medical centers and hospices sometimes do honoring ceremonies for their veteran patients. Yeah, I, that's a, I think that's a really hard one. I, a partly, it's, you, you hear this all the time, Medal of Honor winners are a little embarrassed because they don't feel like they are heroes. Um, or, or, uh, and it's also a military ethos not to think more highly of yourself than you think of your unit. And, um, and so to, it, it would seem less uh, tr troubling to me if it were a collective thing and a group of veterans were being honored uh, so that it wasn't singling out an individual. I think that's one of the things that veterans are most embarrassed by is when they're held up as individual heroes. Um, uh, and I, that's not to say some veterans wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't appreciate it and, and, and benefit from it, but if they themselves don't feel like they're good people, which is Part of what moral injury does to people is it makes them feel like they're not decent folk. Um, to then honor them for 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 something may just make them feel even worse and more isolated. It can be isolating to be put on a pedestal when the whole point is that you feel detached from everybody already. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, Jim. Jim. Sorry. Go ahead. It has. I saw Jim nodding. <laughs> It has some of the same qualities as Christmas or any other major holiday in the sense that for lots of people, those are times for celebration, but for some people, they're times of great pain. Uh, in my experience of long-term care, uh, you know, if such a thing were to happen, nursing staff probably wouldn't know to say, take John or Mary out of the room because it would be too traumatic. And so what happens is that they, they say, oh, I know that person is a veteran and they shove them into the group, at which point then that person has some kind of a behavioral right. outbreak from it. Right, it can in be traumatized, some, yeah. Right. So the question then is, can we move that to diagnosis? For the most part, the nursing response is to quiet the person um, to the extent uh, or extreme extent sometimes of medication. Uh, but uh, maybe that should be used diagnostically to tell us there's something more that we can be working with them on and to try to listen more to that person. So. Right. Functionally, I, I think they're wonderful things to do if, if that can be done well. But the challenge of them is for that person with the, who's, who associates more trauma than pride. This is one place where having family, um, having some context um, um, can be helpful. I, I see Kyle mentioning um, music and I, I do think that that's a really important ritual resource um, that may be evocative um, for a person in an appropriate way. And um, so listening for that as an aspect of their tradition or knowing, or you're drawing as Kyle suggests from um, um, the music associated with a particular branch of the service um, could be helpful. So uh, I failed to mention music I, um, and that could be helpful. It, the main reason I sort of went to the concept of body is I, I worked one time with um, uh, a psychologist who was an expert on amnesia. And she had worked with the very famous person, I think his name was H, his, his initial form was H, who was a, 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 an amnesia case. Um, and the, uh, he wasn't able to to add memory, he, he was stuck at the age of 24. And he, when he looked in the mirror, he thought he was seeing his father. Um, and um, she said that the, the thing that she figured out with him is that if you gave him a mirror and a sheet of paper and asked him to do certain cognitive memory tasks, he could do them, but he didn't know he was doing them. 
So it, it also occurs to me that art, that actual creation of, of things might also be a way that someone who couldn't speak of a, a traumatic memory might be able to actually depict it. Yeah, and, and we've even with non amni I mean, with just regular veterans in our program, when we've asked them to make a mask of their military face, they they themselves are sometimes surprised by what their mask looks like when they're done. It strikes me that art, Rita, might also allow a person to to move closer to giving voice to something. First of all, by drawing it. Yeah. Um, I, I want to raise a question that while I have Jim's expertise um, ever, and others of you that are on the webinar, but I'm, I'm also thinking about moments that may happen um, with quite elderly veterans um, who are affected, let's say, Jim, not with dementia, not with um, Alzheimer's, but with what you call circulatory and I still call vascular dementia. So um, memory, you know, short term memory shot. Um, and I remember visiting or being with a, a veteran, um, so 70 years after his service. And, um, and for many of those years, this person didn't disclose to me um, uh, memories of war that were other than uh, fun, trivial. Um, but uh, near Memorial Day weekend, spent an entire afternoon grieving and, um, and talked when I asked, um, said that he was rem remembering who didn't come home. And I'm not so sure, I don't know to the extent that that was moral injury, um, except maybe that he did and they didn't. Um, but had I known now what I, or had I known them what I think I know a little bit more about now, um, I might've been able to go deeper in uh, about that grief uh, and what it, what it means to him that he came home. Um, but it, it, I mentioned that, Jim, partly to, it, do you think I was right about what was likely going on uh, and Rita too, and, um, and, and then just simply raise it as that's more likely, it seems to me, that I might happen to visit in a retirement community or a VA center or a home when a person is remembering um, and perhaps Memorial Day weekend uh, helped to prompt it too, though I'm not sure this person knew that it was Memorial Day weekend. Um, but there could just be moments where if we're attentive, we can invite a conversation. Would that make sense uh, to you all? Yeah, Victor Frankl used to talk about uh, survivor guilt. Mm -hmm. and basically having lived, uh, being a psychiatrist who lived through the Holocaust himself, right. uh, the, the issue was, um, he used to say there should be no such thing as survivor guilt, only survivor responsibility. Mm -hmm. Normally, our clinical response to survivor guilt is to try to go the direction of look at all you've done and all you've contributed. Mm -hmm. um, and the focus then is on your life. But what Frankel was pointing to was uh, to tell the story of the people that you uh, have missed because they did not survive uh, right. and so that they continue to have their story alive. Not right. every person with dementia can remember more than the sense of hollowness that someone didn't. They may not be able to say that it was Larry Moe or Joe right. or whatever, um, but uh, they, you, you can get them talking usually in generalities. Uh, remember diagnostically, the first thing to go for most persons with dementia are proper nouns. Uh, and, and then they move into proper verbs and, and they start talking in adverbs and, and adjectives and like that. Uh, and eventually they come into clauses and by then there's very little you can usually do with this. But uh, try not to pin them down to proper names. Yeah, uh, no, that wasn't what I was, what I was getting at. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, Jim, I have, Jim, I have a question for you. Um, in looking at the breakdown on the slides that you presented of um, veterans by generation and um, era of service and so forth, I also was wondering about the breakdown by gender, because it seems to me that increasingly over time, a larger percentage of veterans are going to be women um, than they have exactly. been, that that's going to be a trend. So I'm wondering from your work 
to date, or this could be a question for any of you, anecdotally or otherwise, if you are aware of any differences, gender-based differences, either in presentation of, um, of, of um, symptoms or response to interventions or anything, anything like that, but, but with a gender low uh, focus. Uh, two, two things come to mind very quickly. First of all, um, women tend to outlive men uh, and therefore you're gonna have more of them available to you. Uh, and the, so the second issue, therefore more women get dementia, uh, not yeah. necessarily because women are more susceptible to it, but they, they simply live longer. The, the other thing that occurs to me uh, is the environmental impact. And I take this out of uh, firehouses more than I do veterans. But um, I, when, a, when it's the woman who's in line and takes the shot uh, among police officers um, and is probably the one who killed the person who was in the middle of death by cop in the first place, um, everyone assumes she's going to have a harder time with it because she's a woman than uh, they do a guy. Uh, and so there's this kind of environmental sense of women are going to have a harder time with things. And that impacts the women too. I mean, you, you, the woman, a woman who goes on the police force has to have a certain amount of, uh, uh, in Yiddish, I'd call it chutzpah, but uh, it has to, there has to be a certain kind of presence that protects against a little bit of that. But when you did, in fact, just shoot somebody, no matter what the reason of it, there's a, there's a sense of you have to kind of think about it and, and let that kind of go through. And if everybody around you is assuming you're gonna have more trouble with it than a man would, uh, that environment contributes greatly in my experience of it uh, to the challenge. Uh, and so it remains to be seen uh, since women are relatively new. I did work with uh, Red Cross workers during World War II at one point, women who had been in the Red Cross. Uh, and I didn't see a lot of difference, uh, except for the fact that Red Cross workers back then were volunteers, they weren't military. Um, and therefore what they saw tended to be a little different. The person had already been cleaned up a little bit by the time they got to their hospital kind of a thing. Um, Jim, can I jump in here for a minute since we're near the last minute? I, Kim, you've raised, an, uh, one of the things I wanna mention is the next webinar relates to the intersections of women and military sexual trauma and race. And so part of what I wanna lift up is that um, we, uh, we haven't talked about the ways in which receptive moral injury can be complicated, such as male-on-male um, -male sexual trauma or military sexual trauma experienced by women or racialized trauma. Uh, uh, that's receptive as well as agential, we, we, we don't yet know yeah. um, how that can be impacted by yeah. dementia. And I, I didn't want this comment to go by about what about people who have been harmed by their religious traditions, right? Yeah. right? Because if, you, if somebody's chart says Protestant, you can't assume that, that Protestant religious rituals are necessarily going to be of comfort to them. That's true. Right, and so so there there is also always that that caution. So if you you know that there might be a factor in that person that might have caused them to be in tension with their own religious tradition, um, then I think the use of religious rituals may be highly problematic. Yeah. But there are lots of other rituals in That's life right. that affirm people. So there are ways to sort of figure out how to use ritual. I think it's really crucial to the healing process to be to, because ritual is habit. It teaches you over and over things. Yeah, um, and I, so it implants things much more deeply than ideas do actually, even words. You've underscored such an important part about care, which is that it's always individualized yeah. to this particular person. Yeah. Um, so I think we've come to the time. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you that were on this. Uh, and I wanna remind you that in about two weeks, no later than that, all of this will be posted along with the PowerPoint. And uh, if you go to voa.org slash moral injury, you will find a resources page also with videos and resources and books and articles um, and news stories even about moral injury if you want more information. Right. Also on the, on the Solar Repair Center Repair. website. Yeah. Thank you to all of you that came. I hope you'll be back. And thank you, Kim and Kyle and Sam. Bye, everybody. <laughs>
Blessings. Blessings. Thank you.